My name is Dr. Colt and my pronouns are he and they. Welcome to this multi-video series on how to prepare to undergo surgery and recover from surgery, specifically for folks who are transgender, non-binary, intersex, gender non-conforming, anybody in the gender family, as we call it. I'm going to share the PowerPoint for most of this time that we have together. All right, preparing for surgery and recovery. Um, as I said, I'm Dr. Colt Sanema, and my colleague who uh, worked together with me to create this is Dr. Zoe Amaro Jimenez. They and he pronouns, they are a psychologist in the state of California. I'm a clinical psychologist as well as a family medicine doctor, board certified. And both uh, Dr. Zoe and I are openly transgender, and we have undergone and recovered from surgeries uh, related to our gender as well. So this presentation is informed by both our personal and professional experiences, as well as helping friends and family undergo and recover from surgery. I want to make sure we have a very clear disclaimer. You know, anything that we go over is general information, so it'll be very important that you always follow instructions from your own medical providers. Every single person has their own unique medical background, and general information that works for most people may not work for you. So make sure that you run by anything uh, past your own medical provider that you learn from this. Information here in general, it's based on very standard pre- and post-operative instruction materials, should not be considered uh, medical advice for you. Dr. Zoe and I um, have been working on creating trainings for professionals who see us as transgender patients and write letters for us to have surgery. Um, in the recently published book, Psychological Assessment of Surgical Candidates, Evidence-Based Procedures and Practice, published by the American Psychological Association, Dr. Zoe and I uh, wrote the chapter on gender embodiment surgery. Now, some of you might say, well, gender embodiment surgery, I haven't heard that term before. It's usually gender confirmation surgery, gender affirmative surgery. We like the term embodiment because surgery is one tool that helps us to actualize or realize our embodiments or how we want our body to look and function in a gendered manner. This is the first time that book has had a gender surgery chapter in it. And so we're excited um, to have that as a resource. And then we also are working on some trainings on the gender you so that professionals can learn an affirming way to take care of us. And as we were creating these, we really, you know, we realized the importance of sharing a lot of this information also with the community. So it's not just accessible by professionals, but also by, by everyday folks. So we're going to talk a little bit in this first video about planning, pre-operative. Before surgery, there's a lot of planning that goes into things. Surgery and undergoing surgery is actually the easy part, even though there are multiple steps to it. Recovery is what's really, really hard. And there's a lot that goes on there. And a lot of times we as transgender people, we just want to talk about the exciting part of surgery or the, you know, I'm so excited to have surgery coming up, but we don't like to share the gory details or the things that didn't go so well. So it's important um, that, you know, during these videos that you learn some of those um, experiences that folks have and really realistically prepare. So again, surgery is the easy part. Recovery is what's really hard. And really no one can undergo surgery and recover alone. We need support, not just from our medical staff, but from our chosen family, family of origin, significant others, uh, folks in our lives to, to help us as we get better after surgery. It is underlined very important to have someone that you trust to take care of you throughout the surgery and recovery process. Someone's going to have to change your bandages, and these bandages may be in very sensitive parts of your body. So it'll be important that you're comfortable with this person seeing and touching different parts of you. So it's very important that trust is there, but also trust them to actually show up, to be dependable. Um, if they have active issues going on and they're not regularly showing up for you in their life, it's probably not the right person at the right time uh, to plan to be your number one support, support person. Next is planning about, so you got to figure out who your main support people are. 
And number two, both of y'all or whoever's going to help you needs time off from your work or school or obligations. Do you have pets? Do you have parents you take care of? Do you have kids you take care of? Who all, you know, what are all your obligations? Because you're going to need to have other plans for them. And so you'll have to be able to take time off from that as well as the person who's taking care of you. So I think just as it is important for trans folks and folks who are going to undergo gender embodiment surgery to prepare, it's also important for your caregivers to watch these videos. It's so much better for them to know what they're getting into before they just bring you to surgery and you know, get overwhelmed with a lot of information. So make sure you also spend time talking with your support people um, as you're planning for surgery, especially if you have to travel. So first step, what surgery are you wanting to have? How do I choose which surgery I want? And this is really gonna depend on what your individual embodiment goals are. What you want something to look like or the form of it and the function of it. What do you want something to do? So, you know, we have embodiment goals, literally are head to toe. A lot of people think about surgery in a couple of different categories, whether that's face, voice, chest, breast, internal genitalia removal, so hysterectomy, orchiectomy, um, external genitalia surgery, vulvovaginoplasty, vulvoplasty, phalloplasty, metoidioplasty, a lot of different types of surgeries. And there's also body contouring surgeries as well. So I've got to kind of think about what is most important to me and what are my individual goals for how I want my body to be the same as it, as it is now, but how do I want it to be different? There's a long history of this big old word called endosis normativity. And so let's break that down to make sure we kind of are all on the same page. What the heck does that mean? So endo is short for endosex. It means not intersex. And so if somebody is endosex, it means they do not have a condition known as an intersex condition or have um, the sex that they are assigned at birth and their multiple biologies around that are not questioned to, to be different than male or female. So endosex and then cisgender, cis, most people know that means not transgender and then normativity. So this means there's a history that surgeons and our community believe that you know, the only outcomes for surgery should be endo cis normative. So if I'm saying I'm a trans man, that means that I should want my body to look like an endo sex cisgender man's body. And that's absolutely an option, but it's very limited. And it limits our creativity as trans folks to come up with our embodiment. And more and more these days, surgeons are becoming more open to listen to our, our individualized embodiment goals instead of making assumptions about how we might want our body to look and function. We also have a history of giving away our gift. So what do I mean by this? Being a transgender person, we have a lot of curses and a lot of blessings and gifts too. But sometimes, especially, you know, I grew up as a trans person in the South, it's, easy, it's really easy to get kind of overwhelmed by all of the curses and all the negative things that come along with being transgender, um, specifically meaning how the outside world responds to us, right? But there are blessings and there are gifts and there's a sacredness about being trans as well that sometimes we don't realize. So one of those gifts is being able to actualize or obtain our embodiment or how we want our body to look and function and sound and move, all of those things. But historically, we've been just so desperate in the past, um, in the past hundred years that we were just so excited a surgeon would work with us and we didn't really care, you know, if they didn't have a lot of experience or, you know, we just were like, get this off of me or put this on me and then, and then that's kind of it. And most surgeons, not all, but most surgeons who take care of us are cisgender. And we've just said, I just want to look normal. You know, here you go. And we've given that gift of the specific choice and the agency over our body of what we want to a cisgender person who's well-meaning and wants to help us. And that is not, that is missing the gift. That is giving it away, you know? So it's really important and okay to say, you know, I really want this. Are you able to do this? Bringing pictures of what you want. Um, I want this with nipples or no nipples or I want to preserve my penis, or I don't. Whatever it is, it's important that you communicate your individual goals with the surgeon and make sure that you find the surgeon 
who is willing and able to help you uh, actualize and obtain your goals. So how in the world do I go about choosing a surgeon? It's so important that your surgeon has experience doing these surgeries. And they should be able to show you either on their website or in their office photos of their work. If they don't do that, that's a red flag. And I would not go with that surgeon. They might come up with a lot of different excuses about why they don't have pictures. No excuse, red flag, if they don't have photos of their work. The experience is especially important for the more invasive and complicated surgeries, especially the external genital surgeries like vaginoplasty, vulvoplasty, vulvovaginoplasty, phalloplasty, metodioplasty, et cetera. Um, breast augmentation is something that's very, very common and a lot of surgeons do. And so I would say that's okay if they don't see as many transgender patients if you're getting breast augmentation. But if you're getting a phalloplasty, you really need to be going to somebody who performs those at least once a week. Um, because they are very complicated surgical procedures. So it's really important to not just operate out of a place of desperation and say, I just want this done, I'll see anybody. Because a lot of times what you're going to find is you'll have more surgical complications, less help and support, and you might need a lot more surgeries and probably end up going to somebody who has more experience to get these extra surgeries afterwards. And so it's really important that you pick someone with good experience and works frequently with our community. It's also important to get feedback from other patients. There's all sorts of social media things online and different groups for particular surgeons, so learn from other people's experiences. And then location. Is this surgeon anywhere near you? Many people travel a long way to have surgery um, to find an experienced surgeon who will uh, work with your individual goals. Um, if you are traveling from wherever you stay, when you get there, do you have family? Are you going to get an Airbnb, a hotel? What is your plan? Where will you stay? How long will you stay? Something that I've learned from surgeons over the years is they're really, really great at doing surgery, but many of them underestimate how long it will take to recover. And that's because most surgeons have never stayed with somebody while they recovered from surgery because they're already operating on the next patient the next day. And so usually I tell people, you know, if you're, especially if you're traveling somewhere to expect, you know, for more of the chest surgery, space surgeries, at least one to two weeks in that area, staying in the area. Um, and I would say no more than 30 minutes away from the surgeon's office, because they're the ones that will know how to help you if a complication happens. And then if you're having more um, a genital surgery, you know, like a phalloplasty or vulva, vaginoplasty or vulvoplasty, I would recommend at least a month in the area. Because if you have phalloplasty somewhere and then you go two states away where no surgeon knows how to help you if you have a complication, then you have to just go right back over there. You might um, lose your flap. There, there's a lot of issues that can happen if you're so far away. So staying in the area is very important and very challenging and costly as well. It also matters for whoever's going to go with you and be your person to take care of you. You know, are they able to get off that much time from work? Can they work remotely? What does that look like for them as well? And then cost. Surgery is not cheap. Um, thank goodness a lot of insurance companies in the States um, are covering surgeries these days, but not all of them do. Um, there's out-of-pocket costs. There's costs for anesthesia. Um, the people who put you to sleep, that may be separate from the cost that you're quoted from your surgeon. There's cost of your hotel stays and your accommodations. There's cost for food, transportation. This can be very expensive. So it's important to start saving early. And then trauma-informed accommodations. What does that mean? I want you to think about if there are any accommodations that might help you get through the surgery and recovery process a little bit smoother. So for example, if you're a person who's experienced a lot of abuse and are worried about who's going to see you and touch you while you are unconscious, um, it's important to, to talk to your surgeon and your nursing team about that. Many teams are really awesome and they'll introduce you to everybody first. They'll tell you every step that's going to happen. So for example, even if you're having a surgery that's not a genital surgery, you might be getting a catheter in your urethra or where pee comes out of you. And so somebody while you're asleep may actually be touching your genitalia to put the catheter in and then later take it out. And you might wake up and feel a little uncomfortable in your genital region. And that might trigger their dysphoria, a trauma response, et cetera. So make sure that, you know, if you're worried about any of those things, 
that you have a conversation with the surgeon's team about this to have an accommodation for you. Um, other things, some people are really nervous about getting an IV in them, and that's just a big thing. Don't be afraid to ask for accommodation to ask to talk to your teams about this. Many, most of these teams are amazing. They understand the history of trauma. They understand this, you know, negative experiences and they want people to have a good experience. So think about different accommodations that you might ask for um, that would make you feel more comfortable going through this process. That also looks like when you go to a consultation, many surgeons just walk in and kind of take the clothes off and start touching and looking and that may be upsetting for many people. And so you definitely have the right to say, hold on, before you touch me and then just say, I'm really nervous about this. Can we do this slowly? Whatever it is that you need. It's important to state um, your desire for accommodations and find a surgeon who will work with you with that and the team as well. And then the letters situation. Okay, so we're, we picked a surgeon, we picked a surgery, we're figuring out our plans. Well, some folks may need letters for surgery. What, is, what does that mean? Well, WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, has the Standards of Care, SOC. They've created those since the 70s. So there's an eighth edition update that just came out recently in the 2020s. And it actually says that we don't, there's not a requirement in the standards of care or the guidelines anymore for letters from a mental health professional to undergo surgery. Before, there were, were all sorts of requirements. There was two letters if you're having genital surgery or surgery that could affect your fertility, one letter if it's just any other surgery from mental health providers specifically, and then another letter from whoever is your hormone provider or your general primary care doctor. And so that could be three or two letters, um, one from the medical provider, one from the mental health provider, or two from the mental health provider. So even though the new guidelines say these letters are no longer required, surgeons and insurance companies may actually still want or require a letter or two or three. So it's important to, to check in with both the surgeon as well as your insurance company. And the surgeon's office a lot of times works with your insurance company, so they may be able to give you that information to learn what all you need with letters, because sometimes it can take a while to get a letter. All right, and then, what I found is that, so WPATH, the last standards of care they have, the number seven, my role as a mental health provider was to assess somebody's psychological and practical preparedness to undergo surgery. And what I found is that most people are very psychologically ready, but very few people understand the nuances and have um, kind of prepared fully, practically. And so that's one of the reasons that we're doing this video is to really help people get planning, feel more comfortable, you know, and feel like, all right, um, I feel confident in my planning and I have, you know, plans for emergencies, backup plans, et cetera, which we're going to talk about um, during this series.